Welcome to the National Hypertension Control Initiative, the webinar on ACT Rapidly. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining from. Just a quick couple of housekeeping items, and we'll turn it over to the stars. So first, we're going to start out with the closed captioning. We're running the closed captioning capability. You can control it. Down on the bottom of your screen, you can make it bigger, smaller, pop it out for a full running transcript, or turn it off if you're finding if it gets in the way. With respect to Q&A and chat, please use the Q&A button to submit your questions. It makes it much easier for us to curate, monitor, track all those questions, and you have the ability to upvote your favorite. That'll bring them up towards the top so we can make sure we focus on answering those that uh, most people are interested in. Please use the chat to watch for resource links and also comment. Make your, you know, these, this is a great place for editorial, add your thoughts. Chat is where we get some wonderful engagement. Just be sure to put your questions in Q&A so we can curate those there. There will also be a feedback post-event survey at the end of this. It should take less than two minutes to fill out. And besides getting the regular just event feedback this uh, particular round, we also have a few questions on your resource needs. So please be sure to look in the chat box at the end of the meeting for the link to take that post-event survey. With that, we're going to turn it over to Pamela Garman Johnson, the National Executive Director of the NHCI program. Over to you, Pamela. Well, thank you so much, John, and hello and welcome. I am delighted to be able to welcome you here this afternoon to the NHCI Act Rapidly webinar. You know, we are um, continuing this series so that you continue to have an understanding how we can work together to improve blood pressure control. Um, we are excited uh, now to highlight um, some really exciting, um, an exciting um, event that happened this week with Vice President Harris who actually visited the Unite, Unity Health Center in Washington, DC. And during her visit, she asked a lot of questions around blood pressure management. And you will see highlighted on the wall where she paused to learn more about blood pressure management, um, which features the Target BP poster. And so we are delighted that she actually shared this in her social media, and we were able to amplify that. So the work that we are all collectively doing to hyper-focus on how we can um, focus on um, blood pressure control um, is even being highlighted by our own vice president. Um, Right now, I'd like to just um, reiterate um, your ability to ask questions um, throughout today's presentation. And then also, I would like to walk us through the agenda. First is um, going through the core curriculum. You will learn about some of the scheduling updates and opportunities to see some, um, of, um, some of the webinars that will be showcased again. Um, secondly, Acting Rapidly, um, part one, and a focus on the 2017 AJACC Hypertension Guidelines. And I'm excited because we do have a guest speaker, um, someone that I have known a um, very long time in my career at the American Heart Association and Dr. Ferdinand's work, um, specifically on his expertise, both in the clinical setting, as well as the community setting and our opportunity to leverage both in order to achieve blood pressure control. Thirdly, um, we will go through the workshop outline and um, uh, being able to speak to the quick start guide and the pre-assessment, and of course, Q&A at the end. However, you know that you can utilize the chat box for any questions throughout today's webinar. At this time, I am so delighted um, to introduce you to Sonia. Um, who is one of the um, NHCI clinical practice facilitators, and she is going to talk about the health center engagement and assessment. Sonia? Thank you. Um, with this, we're going to move into the core curriculum. Next slide. Here is, we have a design, um, a layered approach 
for providing a, pro a progression of support to training and technical, um, technical assistance. So you will see this throughout many of our webinars and it's just for a uh, you know, refresher that we'll be providing to you in our webinars. Next slide. With today's webinar, we, um, as you can see, we are kicking off our Act Rap Rapidly series with um, initially with our today's webinar. We're also gonna provide a repeat of these webinars twice on the 31st of August. Um, we're gonna have one in the morning uh, at 8 a.m. and we also are gonna have one at 5 p.m. We also noticed the things that we have for our Act Rapidly Diagnosis and Treatment Algorithms, which is for September 14th, with the change that we had made initially, it was for September 15th. But we also wanted to highlight that change for everybody. Next slide. With this, we're gonna kick off with our first poll question. Uh, we would like to know who's on joining us today. Please indicate your role and professional background in your health center. We're gonna take a brief moment for this poll. First poll question always takes a little longer to kick off. Let's give it about another 10 seconds or so. Great participation level. We'll give it five more. Okay, we have our results. It's always good to see a good diverse of professionals joining us. We look forward to seeing the same in our next webinars. Thank you so much. For our poll question number two. Does your health center have and use a treatment algorithm? Again, we'll take a brief moment for the question. And thank you all for uh, participating in our poll questions. Good response, almost there. Let's give it another five seconds or so. Okay, we can see our results here. I wanna thank you all so much for answering, taking time for our poll question. And with our next slide, we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Eduardo Sanchez. Thank you. Hey everybody. Uh, this is Eduardo Sanchez. I serve as the principal investigator for the National Hypertension Control Initiative. And I also am uh, the chief medical officer for prevention at the American Heart Association. Um, I am so pleased to be um, uh, getting to introduce my colleague, um, Keith Ferdinand, uh, to y'all. I've known Keith for a while. Um, and uh, he is somebody who um, all of us kind of hold in high esteem. He uh, serves as the professor of clinical medicine at the Tulane University Heart and Vascular Institute. Um, he's back in New Orleans um, after years of doing clinical work, research, and teaching at Xavier University, LSU, Baylor College of Medicine, and Emory University. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand began his medical career with a BA in biology from the University of New Orleans, followed by an MD from Howard University College of Medicine in DC, an internship at the US Public Health Hospital in New Orleans, an internal medicine residency cardiology fellowship at LSU Medical Center uh, and cardiology fellowship at Howard University Hospital, DC. So he's uh, steeped in um, things uh, Louisiana and New Orleans. And I say that because I first heard of and got to hear from and, and hear the words of Keith Ferdinand uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And um, his words um, were uh, impactful. Um, he's been deeply involved and held leadership roles with many national organizations, including the Association of Black Cardiologists, 
the American Society of Hypertension, National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, uh, the Healthy Heart Community Prevention Program, um, uh, uh, that is a, a cardiovascular risk program that's targeting African-American and other high-risk populations. Um, he served as an inaugural member of the Target BP Advisory Group, um, and, and he has done so much with and for uh, the American Heart Association in volunteer roles and in science expert roles, um, all in the name of improving blood pressure control and improving outcomes uh, for, for patients, particularly those who find themselves disenfranchised and otherwise um, not taken care of the way they might ought to. Um, he focuses largely on cardiovascular risk factor evaluation and control, particularly focused on hypertension and hyperlipidemia, including communities of racial and ethnic um, groups that are, again, often underserved and or disenfranchised. His passion for patient care is high, highlighted in his tireless commitment to nonprofit work and community service. Um, nobody, nobody explains science um, in a more clear and convincing manner that is informed by and helps inform real world experience. So without any further ado, uh, Keith Ferdinand, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And as you know, I do this because I think it is my commitment to give back to my community. Those of you who are clinicians, I'm with you. I had clinic today and I continue to see patients, many of whom have uncontrolled hypertension. Next slide. We're gonna talk about current best practices for hypertension control. We'll build on the recommendations from the 2017 ACCHA hypertension guideline. Next slide. Here are my disclosures. I'm not gonna specifically talk about any one particular drug or product. Next slide. The guidelines were published in 2017, and they stand today as the best practice for the detection and control of high blood pressure. Next slide. Indeed, many of the slides that I'm going to use were adapted directly from the guidelines, but I've added some personal touches to help inform you of some of the best means we can control high blood pressure which is the most powerful predictable risk for cardiovascular disease. So we'll start with some salient aspects of the guidelines. We'll talk about the new classification of high blood pressure. I explain this to my patients on a regular basis, why we've changed the definition of what hypertension is. We'll discuss blood pressure thresholds. We'll specifically review resistant hypertension. Those are persons who have their blood pressure uncontrolled despite three medications at maximum tolerated doses. And then we'll focus on some special populations, African-Americans, persons with diabetes and older persons. And then finally, I'll give you some of my personal insights on the importance of adherence and how we can overcome these disparities. When we talk about the guidelines, next slide, make sure that you look for evidence that's class one, that's the strongest evidence, next slide. You like class 1A or class BR, these are going to be from randomized clinical trials or meta-analyses. Next slide. So let's first look at the flow chart. This is directly from the 2017 blood pressure guideline. Measure blood pressure accurately. I know most of you are aware of the need to measure blood pressure in an appropriate manner. Detect white coat hypertension and masked hypertension. And that's using out of office blood pressure, whether it be self-measured or ambulatory monitoring. We'll talk about medications, but we know the importance of lifestyle interventions, especially low sodium diet for middle aged and older persons. And we'll discuss treatment goals. Next slide. Remember to calculate ASCVD risk. It's easy to do. It gives the patients the opportunity to understand that although they may not have symptoms, they still may have increased risk. And we know that race and ethnicity are not biologic or actual terms that have an expert basis. They are most social terms, but they do give us an opportunity to identify those patients who had increased risk and have special problems related to hypertension. We also focus on sex, sex and gender, of course, not only in high blood pressure, but across our medical field, there are some unique aspects, especially relates to women. 
and the need for appropriate follow-up with patients. It's not enough to give the patient guidelines, not enough to write prescriptions, but we need to follow up and detect and reverse non-adherence. Next slide. So here I've highlighted, next slide, stage one hypertension starts at 130 over 80. This is based on observational data. Stage two hypertension, previously called hypertension at 140 over 90, if you wait until a person develops 140 over 90, in the population-based analysis, their risk for heart attack and stroke has already doubled. Next slide. When we look across race or ethnic groups, and I've already suggested to you that these are not true biologic or genetic risk categories, but in those persons who self-identify as non-Hispanic Black patients or African-American, almost 60% of those patients have hypertension by the new guideline. Next slide. And if you look at age, age is one of the most powerful predictors of risk. Three-fourths or more of your patients who are 65 and older will have hypertension. I'll make some comments on how best to approach these patients. Next slide. Now, this is called the Lewinsing analysis because it developed the idea that when you just observe patients, this is not an interventional study, but a meta-analysis of individual data, 61 prospective studies. Next slide. You'll see, next slide, a linear, direct, and consistent relationship, especially between systolic blood pressure, and in this case, ischemic heart disease mortality. The big arrow points to the impact of age. You can see that age is a very powerful predictor of risk. So for all practical purposes, anyone who has a blood pressure greater than 130 over 80, especially older persons, are at markedly increased risk. Next slide. And the similar relationship in the Lewinson analysis can be seen for the uh, stroke risk. Stroke can also be caused by atrial fibrillation and hemorrhage, but we know most persons who have ischemic stroke, it is due to uncontrolled or poorly controlled hypertension, again, with an increased risk if you look at the impact of age and stroke. Next slide. Most of you have heard of the SPRINT trial. The final results of SPRINT were just published this year in which they looked at an intensive blood pressure control to a goal of less than 120. They actually achieved a systolic blood pressure of approximately 123 versus the previous routine management to a goal of less than 40. This is over 9,000 patients who are middle-aged and older. Next slide. And what we see in the final analysis of SPRINT is that those patients who had intensive blood pressure reduction as a goal had an improvement in the primary outcome of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, stroke, and cardiovascular death. Next slide. Furthermore, if you look at the various components of the outcomes in SPRINT, not only was the primary outcome met with a strong statistical significance of less than 0.001, but there was also a decrease in heart failure, a decrease from death from cardiovascular disease, and a decrease in death from any cause. And there's not much that we do in medicine that decreases total mortality. So intensive blood pressure reduction is one of the best things you can do for your patients. Next slide. This is a subgroup analysis of the various patients who were in SPRINT, and you can see whether or not they had chronic kidney disease, whether they were 75, older or less than 75, male or female, self-identified as black or non-black, previous cardiovascular disease, yes or no, and even in those patients who entered SPRINT with a systolic blood pressure equal to or less than 132, there was a significant reduction with intensive blood pressure reduction. Now, I mentioned the ASCD risk calculator. I do this on a regular basis with my patients. Next slide. It's easy to do. You can do it on the web. You can do it through the phone while talking to the patient on the cell phone. They give extra points for being African-American. Again, this is not biologic or genetic. It's because in the cohorts that were observed, those patients who self-identified as African-American had an increased risk for heart attack strokes or dying within 10 years. Next slide. Now, these data unfortunately suggest the following. The top dotted lines are all forms of cardiovascular disease. Panel B are non-Hispanic white, Panel E is non-Hispanic Black. And if you look at all forms of cardiovascular disease, you see that they have been coming down over the last several years, but there's a plateau 
starting at about 2010, both in whites and blacks. Next slide. Even more importantly, if you look at mortality, this is a hard endpoint, death from all forms of cardiovascular disease, the rates are much higher in non-Hispanic black population than in non-Hispanic whites. Next slide. And this is primarily driven by hypertension. Another reason that we treat hypertension is to reduce heart failure. Here you can see black men in the light blue, black women in the orange. Again, a disparity, higher rates of heart failure, death in black men compared to white men, black women compared to white women. You note in the older age group, the disparity is somewhat less. There are several reasons for that. One is people who are 65 and older have Medicare, so they have insurance. And also there's the healthy survivor. Because there's more premature death in the African-American population, you have the healthy survivors who then make it to the older age, still disparities, but not as remarkable in the 35 to 64 years of age group. Next slide. This translates to longevity itself. Non-Hispanic black males of all the major racial ethnic groups have the shortest life expectancy. Black females have a shorter life expectancy compared to white females. And you note that life expectancy in some of the data tends to be higher for Hispanic Latinx populations, although these data are not disaggregated and they actually underestimate the risk in certain Hispanic Latinx populations. Next slide. But unfortunately, this white black death gap, which has been present for years, has actually gotten worse. These are data that look at life expectancy with the impact of COVID-19 which has especially impacted Hispanic Latinx population and Black populations. Next slide. You can see the white-Black death gap comparing white to Black, which has been persistent for decades and now it's somewhat around 2015. But with the impact of COVID-19 and the excess mortality, the gap has now increased. And the so-called Hispanic paradox where there appeared to be no worsening of longevity for self-identified Latino Hispanic populations has now been erased. Next slide. Let's go back to hypertension itself. It's not a problem of awareness. In fact, here you're looking at non-Hispanic black in the yellow, Hispanic, Asian, and light blue and dark blue, total population in the red, non-Hispanic white in the orange. And you can see that the awareness and even the treatment level is equal, maybe somewhat better. The problem is control. And across all populations, we don't have appropriate control and there's disparate control among racial ethnic populations. Next slide. So what does the guideline say in terms of threshold and goals? Next slide. What the guidelines suggest is that in almost all patients, other than those young persons who have very low risk, you start to treat patients with a blood pressure of 130 over 80 and above, and almost for all patients, except for those who are status quo stroke, the goal is a systolic blood pressure less than 30. Next slide. Here are a cohort of various patients. I bolded some of the most important ones, persons with diabetes, Goal, less than 130 over 80, chronic kidney disease, heart failure, and patients who have had peripheral arterial disease and other comorbid conditions, all a goal of less than 130 over 80. Next slide. Now, who does that? Who reaches this goal? Well, here you're looking at the older goal of less than 140 over 90, which is not as rigorous, but Kaiser does an excellent job. Here you can see that the Kaiser control to less than 140 over 90 is as much as 80 to 85%. But also there still is a persistent gap in the black versus white patients. There are a lot of reasons for that. And perhaps Eduardo and I can discuss those at another time. But overall, using a algorithm approach, a team-based approach, Kaiser does an excellent job with blood pressure control. Next slide. Here's their algorithm. They start with a combination of an ACE inhibitor lysinopril with a thiazide type diuretic, if needed, they then add a calcium channel blocker. Those three drugs in most hypertension control centers are the ones that are used. A RAS blocking agent, whether it be an ACE or an R, a thiazide type diuretic in more difficult patients, you may want to consider chlorothaladone or endapamide, and a long-acting calcium channel blocker. 
The other thing is that you can add an aldosterone antagonist, such as spironolactone, and get an excellent further response to blood pressure control. Next slide. Another cohort that's shown the ability to control blood pressure excellently uses a different algorithm, and that was from the great late Ron Victor. This is the LA Barbershop study, starting with the baseline blood pressure of 152 to 153. They were able to have a very robust 27 millimeters of blood pressure control in a self-identified Black population in South Central LA. Furthermore, using even the more rem a uh, more vigorous blood pressure control goal of less than 130 over 80, they were able to get two thirds of patients to a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80, starting with a baseline systolic blood pressure of 152. This is an editorial I wrote in circulation related to what are some of the positive components. They used a two drug therapy protocol, which is somewhat different from the Kaiser protocol versus a thiazide ACE inhibitor, they used amlodipine, a long-acting calcium channel blocker with an angiotensin receptor blocker, and in some cases, an ACE inhibitor. But still starting with a two-drug combination as the first step in difficult to control patients, they were able to show very good responses. For the thiazide type diuretic, they did not use hydrochlorothiazide. They used one called indapamide. It is cost-effective, readily available, and added to the combination of a first step amlodipine ARB, they were able to show excellent blood pressure reduction in the cohort of African-American men. Next slide. And if you look at the LA Barbershop study, there are some other components that in my editorial I felt were very important. The barbers didn't treat the blood pressure. It was done by a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist, confirming the need for a team-based approach to blood pressure control. Furthermore, one of the things that's great about the Black Barbershop, it is a trusted site of blood pressure intervention. And hopefully all of our clinic settings can be a trusted site for our clients. Furthermore, it was a collaboration between the physician and the clinical pharmacist. I think similar collaborations with the nurse practitioner, physician assistant will go a long way with controlling blood pressure. And finally, next slide, they use in those difficult to treat patients and aldosterone antagonists. They use ipilinone, the one that you're used to, spironolactone. Ipilinone is similar. It does not have some of the estrogen stimulation, so you don't get the breast tenderness and the gynecomastia. But the idea is pharmacotherapy works, having the trusted site of blood pressure control works, and a team-based approach works. Next slide. Now let's talk about resistant hypertension. Next slide. There is actually a scientific statement from the American Heart Association that was published after the 2017 guideline. And there are many causes for resistant hypertension. One of the worst causes is under treatment. They call that clinical inertia. The person has elevated blood pressure and we just don't do the right thing to make sure that we increase pharmacotherapy and lifestyle interventions. And of course, medication non-adherence is another difficulty and we'll discuss that at the end. Next slide. Here's the algorithm from the American Heart Association Working Group Report. They also suggest that adding an aldosterone antagonist as a fourth step is important, either spironolactone or if you're concerned with estrogen stimulation, ipilinone. Next slide. They confirmed the need for lifestyle therapy interventions, including low sodium diet, adequate sleep, weight loss, and physical activity, looking of course for secondary causes or identifiable causes of hypertension, which are commonly not seen. Most patients have what we call primary or essential hypertension. And they suggest using the following combination, a RAS blocking agent, whether it be an ACE inhibitor or an R, a calcium channel blocker, and a thiazide type diuretic. They also suggested more difficult to treat patients consider chlorothalidone or indapamide as the additional diuretic versus hydrochlorothiazide. Next slide. Let's go now to some special patient groups, some aspects of blood pressure control, which may be unique. We know that African-Americans are a high risk population. Next slide. And one of the main drivers of that is a higher rate of hypertension in non-Hispanic black adults, much higher than that seen in other racial ethnic populations. Next slide. 
I will bring back to your attention using some of the newer data, 60% of non-Hispanic black adults will have hypertension. So this is gonna be an easily identifiable, difficult at times to control, but important risk factor for cardiovascular disease, especially in the black population. Next slide. This is an analysis looking at the impact of hypertension on the disparity of death rates and hypertension itself as the primary cause of related death is much higher, twice as high in the non-Hispanic black population than in Hispanic Latinx or non-Hispanic white population. So one of the best things we can do for that particular subpopulation is to identify, treat, and control hypertension. Next slide. Unfortunately, some of the more recent data, this is using the older goal of less than 140 to 90, but this was most recently reported in JAMA in 2020, the control rates are going the wrong way. We're actually seeing a decrease in blood pressure control possibly related to the aging of the population, increase in obesity, decrease in physical activity, and an increase in sodium intake across the population. Next slide. In the Munter analysis of blood pressure control, there are several factors that he was able to identify who had less control, again, non-Hispanic black populations compared to non-Hispanic adults, and two populations, the very old, 75 or greater, which we're gonna discuss in a few minutes, but also the younger persons who probably have a sense of that they will not have side effects or complications from hypertension itself. Who has better control? Patients who have private insurance, patients who have Medicare, patients who have an identifiable source of care. And we hope that the medical home concept means that the person has an identifiable source of primary care in which they know that they can have their blood pressure measured and controlled. And the worst control were patients who had not visited any healthcare facility in the last year. Next slide. In stage renal disease, here the color code for the key has changed black or African Americans in the orange. But unfortunately, the data still reflect a disparity with higher rates of in stage renal disease in African Americans than in other racial ethnic populations. Although I will admit, that the Native American or indigenous population is probably under-recognized to the higher rates of end-stage renal disease that's seen in some of those patients. Next slide. So how do you treat patients who have hypertension, especially African-Americans? Well, one drug is not gonna be enough, but if it's initial drug therapy, there are data that the thiazide type diuretic is important or the long-acting calcium channel blocker. On the other hand, this is a class one evidence from the 2017 guideline. Next slide. Most patients, especially middle-aged and older, are gonna need two or more antihypertensive agents. So the Kaiser approach of the thiazide diuretic with lisinopril or the LA barbershop approach of amlodipine with the RAS blocking agent as a first step makes good sense since these patients are gonna additionally need more medications, especially if you're attempting to achieve the blood pressure target of less than 130 over 80. This is especially true also in black adults. Diabetes is a comorbid condition. Again, unfortunately, next slide, there's a disparity with non-Hispanic blacks in the red, Hispanics in the green, having higher rates of diabetes. You also see a higher rate of diabetes in self-identified Asian American populations. Next slide. For patients who have diabetes, when you do a risk calculation, diabetes gives additional risk. Most of them are gonna be in a high risk category. So the guidelines suggest that you initiate therapy at a blood pressure of 130 over 80 with a goal of less than 130 over 80 in persons who have diabetes, which is very common, especially in racial and ethnic minorities. Now let's, trans, uh, let's translate over to the older adults, patients who are 65 years or greater. We know if you look at the randomized clinical trial evidence, it is no longer acceptable to suggest that persons who are 65 and older have, quote, normal blood pressures, which are 100 plus their age. So if you're 60, it's 160. That is no longer considered appropriate. And in fact, the randomized clinical trials show that you can decrease cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And if done appropriately, there is no increased risk of orthostatic hypotension or falls. Furthermore, if you do the risk calculation, 
88% of your older patients, 98% of your men are going to have a higher risk calculation such that their goal is less than 130 over 80. And even for persons who are 75 years or greater, if you can remember the sprint analysis, I showed you the subgroup population less than or equal to 75 or greater than 75, those who are greater than 75 still benefit from the intensive blood pressure reduction. Next slide. If you have an older person, therefore, there's an initiation of blood pressure medications at 130 over 80. There's randomized clinical trial evidence showing benefit. Of course, it should be done safely. Now, if you look at SPRINT, look at clinical trials, you are de facto looking at patients who are ambulatory, able to travel to treatment and tolerate medicine. So I'm not suggesting that we intensively add medicines without taking into care of who the patient is and what patients will tolerate what medications. Nevertheless, for older adults, this is directly from the guideline, target blood pressure is equal to or less than 130 over 80. Initiation of two agents can be done and it should be done cautiously, monitoring for orthostatic hypotension in the history of falls. Now let's discuss some practical strategies, how you can take these concepts and control hypertension and reduce disparities. First of all, we noted that only a minority of the various responses use treatment algorithms. And that's okay, but the clinician should have in mind that patients are gonna need, in most cases, two or more medications, especially middle-aged and older, and especially African-American, patients with obesity, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. Those two or more medicines can either be the thiazide type diuretic RAS blocking, such as the lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide combination, or it can be the long-acting calcium channel blocker and the RAS blocker, such as Ron Victor's approach of using amlodipine with an angiotensin receptor blocker, but most patients are going to need two or more drugs. Assess formularies for the availability of single pill combos. It's not enough to just electronically prescribe. You need to make sure that whatever you're prescribing is available on the person's pharmacy. Ensure timely repeat visits, but even more important, leverage the importance of out of office or self-monitored blood pressure. We do this uh, two lane on a regular basis. Hopefully patients can get a validated blood pressure cuff. There's a site called validatebp.org, all one word, in which they can attempt to get relatively low cost devices and measure their blood pressure out of office. It will help to determine their blood pressure control and make them a partner in their care. In fact, the guidelines give a class 1A evidence for out of office blood pressure control. Next slide. They suggest it be utilized to confirm the diagnosis and further be utilized to titrate blood pressure lowering medications. And we know in the pandemic with telehealth, out of office self-monitored blood pressure is one of the best things we could do when patients either could not come to the clinic or were afraid to come to in-person visits. Let's move on to adherence. This is a working group report that I authored along with some people from the FDA and other nonprofits. And what we looked at is what are some of the factors that lead to non-adherence, that affect adherence. And adherence is important, especially in hypertension because the medications won't work if patients don't take them. I pointed out some of the salient components of non-adherence. For one, it's the provider-patient relationship. Having the patient believe and tie to their provider, their care is one of the best steps that they can do to control blood pressure. We've also seen this with smoking cessation, regardless of the tool, having a strong provider-patient relationship leads to better cessation of smoking. Provider communication skills. It's not enough to stand over the patient and talk to them for only a few seconds or a minute or so. Sit down, eye level, culturally competent, literacy appropriate language and do what we call teach back. Ask the patients, do you have any questions? Do you have any problems with what I just said? Can you tell me what I just communicated to you? Disparity in patient and provider health beliefs. Let the patient tell you what they think about the medication that you prescribed or about hypertension itself and give them the opportunity to ask questions. Clinicians are often in a hurry because of the magic 15 minute visit 
but patients don't need a lot of time. They just need the opportunity to communicate their beliefs regarding their medication and their condition. Of course, high drug costs and co-payments. Fortunately, almost all of the 125 different blood pressure medicines are now generic, but even generic medications on some formularies can be quite costly and patients who have polypharmacy or mini drugs, there still could be a cost burden. Literacy level. Literacy is not the same of intelligence, but a person who is unable to understand what you're saying, either because English is a second language or because of cultural barriers, will not adhere to the medication. They may nod approvingly and actually be very kind in terms of their interaction, but not actually understand the importance of controlling blood pressure or why they need to take so many medications. And the lack of continuity of care. It's not enough just to have the one visit or the two visits, but to have a source of care where the person is comfortable that he or she will get appropriate information and follow up on their care. Next slide. This is a cartoon from the AOA magazine. And I use it because I think it capsulizes what's going on today in medicine. The electronic health record is very important for us to document care and communicate with each other. But too many times we as physicians and other clinicians spend time treating the computer versus interacting with the patient. Next slide. This is a real patient who allows me to use this picture. This is from a campaign we did with Million Hearts several years ago. It's important to sit down eye to eye, literacy appropriate, culturally appropriate communication, using tools, models, bright pictures, pictures of patients who look like the patient, and get them to partner with you in what we call shared decision-making, where it's not enough to just electronic prescribe a medication or suggest a change in lifestyle, but to share with patients what together you're going to do going forward to control your blood pressure and other cardiovascular risk. Next slide. So directly from the guideline, I'd like to close uh, the last slide or two with this particular algorithm. Adherence is most important. Combination therapy can really help. Team-based care. And I talked about team-based care in terms of nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, but note that the team also involves relatives, friends, and the community. Next slide. In conclusion, hypertension, especially in Black adults, leads to high morbidity and mortality, and it decreases longevity. I think most of us as Americans are ashamed of, or we should be ashamed of, persistent white-black mortality gap, driven primarily by poorly controlled risk factors and an increase in cardiovascular disease. These disparities are affected not by genetics, but mostly by lifestyle, socioeconomic status, the built environment, and structural inequalities the term that's used today is the social determinants of health. Third bullet, therapeutic lifestyle changes are clearly important. Low sodium diet, aerobic exercise, avoiding excess alcohol, weight maintenance or weight loss. But in most patients who are middle-aged and older, they will need evidence-based pharmacotherapy, usually two drug therapy and self-monitored blood pressure to achieve hypertension control. And as we suggested from looking at some of the mortality data related to COVID-19. COVID-19 didn't cause these disparities, but it unmasked an unacceptable high rate of longstanding inequalities in our society. Thank you for this opportunity. Eduardo, I look for the chance to speak with you maybe about some questions and follow up. You know, Keith, that was outstanding. Oh my gosh, you covered a lot of a lot of really, really important information in an understandable way. Um, some of our colleagues um, can spend a lot of time and you walk away thinking, wow, that was a, that 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 was that was great, but um, this was great. And um, I heard a few things that I'm gonna reiterate, and then it got some, there's a couple of questions here that we're gonna get into. Um, high blood pressure is prevalent, it's diagnosable and it's treatable. I heard um, one size may not fit all, and there's some nuance. You talked about that nuance, and I think one other key takeaway is clinical inertia is a, an important factor that's got to be overcome. That's why today's webinar is on um, 
acting rapidly. Uh, so uh, one question that came from uh, Marlon Satchel, um, are there, do you have examples of culturally appropriate specific communication strategies for patients? You addressed some of those already, but if you wanna revisit that, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, there are two organizations that have some excellent materials that can help you in communicating with your patient. One is the Association of Black Cardiologists. I'm a previous chair and chief science officer of that organization. And if you go to A-B-C-A-R-D-I-O, abcardio.org, they're free materials, they're very colorful, they're well done, they're comprehensive about cardiovascular risk control, including blood pressure. Target BP, which is the coalition between the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association, is not just about clinical treatment of hypertension, there's a lot of information on how to measure blood pressure appropriately and how to approach patients. There's handouts, tear-off sheets. There are even pictures for patients on how to best measure blood pressure in an effective manner. So that's targetbp.org. PCNA, Preventive Cardiac Nurses Association, PCNA, also has culturally appropriate, literacy appropriate information on hypertension and cardiovascular risk. And of course, the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association separately have their own material related to hypertension. Of course, I'm kind of uh, fond of the ABC since I'm a member of that organization. I'm a member of all the various organizations I just mentioned, but ABC, I'm fond of their material. Thank you, Keith. Um, uh, next question comes from an, another uh, attendee. Um, uh, and wants you to speak to the role that plant-based diet and or increased activity can play in reducing the need for medication. I certainly don't want to suggest that patients don't benefit from lifestyle modification. Plant-based diets are effective in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk. ABC also has a little cookbook nicely done on vegetarian diets or vegan-based diets. The problem is if you make too much of an abrupt change in a person's lifestyle at once, even though they may attempt it, they may not adhere. What I suggest when I give patients information on vegetarianism or vegan diets is that you don't necessarily have to become a vegan or a vegetarian. You can look at this and try to mimic those meals if you wanna add some low saturated fat additions, even from animal sources, that is your choice. But the idea is to mainly have a diet that's high in potassium, that's fresh fruits and vegetables, root vegetables, and low in sodium, that's added salt processed foods. That tends to mimic both the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet, both of which are relatively high in potassium and low in sodium. So, so, so key, physical, act, physical activity, yeah, physical activity, yeah, physical activity is great. It helps with weight maintenance. It's difficult to do for weight loss alone but it also has a great psychological uh, benefit in terms of, of reducing stress and giving a, a sense of overall well-being. But remember, in your middle age and older patients who have had years, if not decades, of uncontrolled hypertension and cardiovascular risk, it is unreasonable to suggest to them that they can throw away their pills and simply modify their diet and start walking, and voila, their blood pressure is going to be controlled. In fact, I tell my patients the opposite. The VA cooperative trials were done in the 1960s. These were men who had blood pressures of about 160 and above. And there were two groups. One group was placed on pharmacotherapy, that's drugs. The other group was placed on placebo. And what happened? After two years, the people who were on placebo, half of them had heart attack strokes or were dead. So what I tell my patients is that drugs are not bad, Pharmacotherapy is a part of your plan, along with the therapeutic lifestyle modification. Thank you, Keith. Really important point. Um, uh, another question: Is there? Um, and and I know you addressed this. Some of this is uh, re re repeating things. Um, but can you talk a little bit about difference in treatment guidelines besides just dosing for various race, ethnicity, or age groupings? There's a lot of controversy on trying to make assessments on a patient based on self-identified race. That being said, 
when you look at the African-American population, there appears to be a better benefit with the thiazide type diuretics, chlorothaladone appears to be excellent, or the calcium channel blockers, amlodipine is an excellent choice. Now, why would that be? Again, I don't think that's genetics. Persons who have more increase in sodium, more obesity, more chronic kidney disease will probably benefit from either diuretics and long-acting calcium channel blockers. But remember, in most cases, these patients are going to need two or more medications. So it's not either going to be a first step that's important. It's what the regimen, the combination. And that's why I showed the Kaiser algorithm, which started with lisinopril with hydrochlorothiazide together, and Ron Victor's LA Barbershop, which used amlodipine and a RAS blocking agent together two medications at once. So it's not as important as the one drug is better than another. It's what regimen, what algorithm we use to treat these patients. Hispanic Latinx patients appear to respond equally to the various medications. And most of the studies have been done in non-Hispanic white population. And there's little data to suggest that one medication is better than another. One medicine we don't use as much as we've used in the past is a tenolol. It's a beta block, it's relatively short acting. It's been shown not to be as effective in reducing strokes and heart attacks, especially in older persons. So if you have a lot of patients who are on a tenolol, we would suggest that you use another combination, the RAS blocking diuretic or the long acting calcium channel block or RAS blocking combination versus a tenolol. It's important, right, to um, uh, taper the tenolol, not abruptly stop it. Well, that's an excellent, that's an excellent uh, observation. Uh, if you're on a beta blocker, you don't just stop it, you cut it back gradually. And the same is true of clonidine. Clonidine is relatively short acting, and it's used a lot, what I call cosmetic blood pressure control. You give the patient clonidine when they're in the office or they're in the urgent care center, and the blood pressure comes down in one to two hours, and you tell, well, your blood pressure is better, you can go home, here's a prescription. The problem with clonidine is that its effect wears off in three to four hours, and it causes excessive drowsiness dry mouth and sexual dysfunction. So the patient will then discontinue it and get a rebound. So clonidine, is, it's used a lot, especially in black patients because you can get that cosmetic control and make your chart look better when you send them home, but that's not an effective way for the consistent control of blood pressure. I think this will be the, the last question, Keith. Um, although I'm gonna say to everybody, uh, as we had mentioned earlier, we're gonna rebroadcast uh, the presentation part of um, today's webinar and then have an extended Q&A. Um, uh, it'll be with um, uh, folks other than Dr. Ferdinand, uh, probably our, our team, but we will have time to go into um, much more detail and spend a lot more time. And we wish we had um, more time with you, Keith. Um, last question, how do you navigate side effects and adherence challenges and side effects that are um, perceived or feared versus side effects that are actually experienced because they're, they're, sometimes it's not the same thing. So management of side effects and then adherence challenges. You know, we see this with COVID-19 vaccinations. Perceptions are probably worse than the reality. And I think the answer is that sit down that you have with the patient for shared decision making. Stay away from medicines that may actually have disabling side effects like clonidine and methyldopa, and utilize medicines that are really well tolerated, angiotensin receptor blockers, ACE inhibitors other than the cough, and let the patient know that there's a chance you may get a nuisance cough, if not, we'll change to another medicine. Thiazide type diuretics do cause frequent urination early, but with time, patients tend to tolerate it. And long-acting calcium channel blockers like amlodipine other than some mild edema, especially in middle-aged and older women, tend to be really well tolerated. But talk to the patient, be real about the potential for side effects, and do what's called shared decision-making, where he or she will tell you what medication they would like to try. So I'm a big fan of um, <clears throat> standing ovations because um, it gets you up and moving your body. And so if you're out there, stand up and give Dr. Ferdinand a round of applause. That was an awesome presentation and awesome Q&A. Um, I'm going to take now uh, the opportunity to hand off to uh, my colleague, Celicia Cardoso, who's going to see us off. Um, and see us out. And um, y'all who participated, thank you so very much uh, for spending time with us.
Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Okay, so in conclusion, thank you everyone for being here today. Let me go ahead and recap the webinar resources for you. So at the end of this recording, you guys will be getting receiving all of the information. So please utilize our NHCI website and our health center hub for more information. You can also review our frequently asked questions and please, please continue to post your questions and provide your feedback at the end of the webinar. Okay, and then please look at our act rapidly. Next, previous slide, please. And these are the upcoming events. So August 31st, we will have another part one of our series from 8 a.m. and also one for 5 p.m. for your convenience. And then another Act Rapidly series Wednesday, September 15th, and we would love to have you there. All right, so go ahead and review the Act Rapidly Quick Start Guide, the pre-assessment for your health centers, and then also consider adoption of treatment protocol all of the resources you guys will have after this presentation. And this is just a recap of everything we've already done. You guys have come a long way. We encourage you guys to continue staying with us, learning and sharing this information as you guys are able to. And please, please, please invite more people so that they can also get the information and share it amongst themselves as well. All right, so this is our learning journey. Everything that you guys have learned up to this point, you guys have those resources. So on the next slide, you'll see exactly where we're at with the Act Rapidly series. You're gonna be talking about the diagnosis and the treatments. And those series are all gonna be recorded, but we really wanna have you guys present as well and asking those questions as you guys receive more questions. All right, so last pool, pool three, looking ahead to partnering with patients, go ahead and let us know, do you have a need for additional blood pressure control education related materials for your staff or for patients? Yes, no, or if you're not sure, you can go ahead and put uninsured. And Celicia, I'm gonna jump in. I'm not gonna show my face anymore, but okay. um, I wanna reiterate, we'd love your feedback. <clears throat> we use your feedback. And there's a link for a quick survey in the chat, please. Um, I promise you, we look at it and uh, we adjust and pivot based on what we hear from y'all. Thank you. Okay, so 77, 76% says yes, so we're doing good. But if you do need any additional information, please let us know. Thank you, everyone. Please, please provide your feedback at the end and you guys will be getting in the email soon. We appreciate having you guys today. And thank you again, Dr. Keith Ferdinand. Awesome.